Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Drug Repurposing for Rare Diseases 2021. Uh, my name is Rick. I'm still the CEO of Find a Cure, I'm glad to say. And uh, we're here today to dive back into the action and really get some great examples of repurposing in the field. Um, today is more of a traditional conference format. We'll have plenty of talks for you to sit back, listen to, and share your thoughts on. So please utilize the use the chat function to share your questions and I'll do my very best to direct as many of them as possible to today's panel. Um, the first thing it is important for me to do is uh, not just welcome you but to thank our sponsors who've helped to make the event today uh, happen and a success. So particularly uh, I'll call that to LifeArc Headline sponsors, um, Helix our corporate partners for, for this year, uh, Gold Supporters uh, the Education Evolution Education Trust and then our silver sponsors Pulse, Pulse Info Frame Purposeful and uh, Pharmacomedics, our bronze sponsor. Thank you to all of you guys for helping to make this possible. We really do appreciate it. Um, I'll stop my screen share so you can see my face nice and large. Um, Today, as I said, uh, it's all about getting far more examples, talks and uh, conversations going and we're really happy to engage with you. For those of you who weren't here yesterday though, don't be scared by our platform. It's really simple and easy to use. If you want to try and uh, get a bit of an insight into how it works, you can go onto our homepage and you should find towards the bottom there some user guidance. So do check that out if you're not sure how to navigate things. Uh, we also have available from yesterday's agenda uh, for you to watch at your leisure our, our first session, Back to Basics, which includes an excellent explanation of the platform uh, from Phil Norman here who can give you the ins and outs of how to make things work successfully. Today's session is called um, number one essentially um, how we go about to repurposing okay and what we're going to have is loads of good examples and this is going to feed through later. We try to think of a theme we try to think of a theme for these topics and the truth is um, what we really want to do is make sure we have a good diversity of talks and speakers. What we're trying to do, therefore, in this session is go from this big macro perspective, looking at how you can work at repurposing from a very top level, looking at the big ways that pharma can be involved, right down to the micro, how individual researchers and individual patients can make a difference. And I hope you'll agree our speakers really help us to do this in a fantastic way. Within the talk uh, sessions as well today, we have not just longer invited talks, but famous Find a Cure lightning talk sessions. Um, We've often done these as separate sessions uh, within our talks, and we thought at this conference we'd do things differently. So we have three souls here uh, on part of our program who are giving a five minute lightning talk, taking the challenge to try and beat the bell. Uh, these are all people who propose their talk uh, as part of the registration process and are, are sharing their examples of research with you. And we're really excited to see how they go. So during those sessions, we will have uh, Phil making time, uh, time in the event. Uh, we'll have a bell ringing towards the end of it and we'll see how close they can get to that five minute deadline. So really excited to see how that goes. Um, so that's a basic overview of what we're up to today. And I hope you'll be really enjoying the session and uh, please do feed your questions through to us, we can see in the chat. So to get things started and kick off, um, we're going to start with one of those lightning talks. And uh, I'm really pleased to, to welcome uh, Georgia Strakis to the stage, uh, who is CEO of Purposeful, uh, one of our sponsors. So Georgia, welcome. Um, Georgia is going to take a, a lightning challenge and he has five minutes to, to fill us in on the work of, of Purposeful. Uh, and his talk, I believe, is titled uh, Rare Disease Treatment, The Purposeful Journey. George, please take it away. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, for the introduction. Uh, let me just try and share my screen. Is that good? Yep, fantastic. Right, well, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, uh, as I said again, Rick, and Find a Cure for the opportunity to uh, give this chat. Um, so uh, first of all, let me talk a little bit about Purposeful. We are an in silico uh, drug repurposing company. Uh, our primary focus is on rare disorders. So I think that we, we fit quite well with the theme of, uh, of this conference. So um, it's uh, interesting that I didn't quite hear the numbers sort of uh, the quote between de novo uh, research and drug repurposing to, to show the, the absolute drop in, in uh, costs and the increase in speed. But here we go. So the three prongs that our research uh, utilizes is drug repurposing, AI, machine learning. And as I said, primarily on rare diseases, this tends to become uh, um, a much safer to start with. Uh, the most important thing is safety, faster and cheaper. Uh, sort of um, 
uh, journey. And uh, if you put in all the math, which I won't bore you with, it makes it nine times more likely to launch. Um, so uh, the company started off trying to uh, prove that our models actually worked in various areas. So we tried to go a little bit broad, neurological, oncology, uh, immunological, and so on. So I've just got a couple of examples here for you that we've uh, worked in inflammatory skin disorders, um, both common and uh, rare, and we've managed to uh, validate several candidates uh, on the preclinical level. Uh, we've tackled glioblastoma, uh, a rare cancer, which uh, we've managed to also uh, managed to alleviate lots of the, uh, um, uh, well, to shrink uh, the tumors in, in an animal model. And finally, uh, I guess the most, uh, the most advanced project of ours is in Fragile X syndrome, where we managed to alleviate all phenotypes um, in the animal models using a double combination, a triple combination, single agents. So we've, we've done quite well in that area. And uh, we are, fingers crossed, uh, about to launch our first uh, human trial. So that, that's uh, quite, quite exciting news um, for us. So how do we do it? Uh, you can see here, there's a sort of a workflow or pipeline, if you will, which starts with, with data. We take data from both the drug side and the disease side, and then we have to look and see whether or not this makes sense. So we have a scientific sanity check, which has to do with, um, do we have enough data? Do we have enough confidence in our models? And then we have the kind of enter the market, which has to do more with um, the, the business side as to, um, are there enough, uh, um, is there an organized patient association? Um, uh, is there an animal model that can prove our point? And, um, and so on, so. Um, and more, more regulatory stuff that I won't get into. Uh, then we have lots and lots of models. So we have, I think, 180 million was the last tally of our AI models. And we link anything that we predict to the, to the disease. Um, we have to go through manual curation as well as the automated curation. So here we have to make sure that what we've actually made predictions for makes sense. Uh, and then finally, we have to consult with people. And this is, this is the main part that sort of um, uh, is, is very important and what I'd like you to take away from this particular slide. So uh, we talk to world experts, we talk to you, we talk to people that are suggested from the patient associations, the trusted labs of, of the patient networks, uh, because without this step, um, I think that the whole process wouldn't work as well. Uh, so when this actually does uh, get put into place, then we can validate our work on the preclinical level and finally try as quickly as possible to get it into a pilot trial so we can see if it actually works in humans. So um, all of this works in a stacked manner. So you can have more data, you can have more sanity checks, you can have more models. So basically anywhere that um, you feel like you can help or collaborate with us, we'd be really, really happy to have you. But as I said, especially in the... Um, uh, in the linking to world experts, scientific advisors, and the patients. So in the second to last step, I think that would be uh, super interesting for us. So uh, please do come and uh, talk to us or have a look at our website or get in touch in any way. So uh, I hope I'm within the five minute margin, but thank you. George, well done. I'm, I'm not hearing any bells ringing. So I think that was quite an impressive time work. I, I, think, I, I think I enjoyed that. <laughs> You had 13 seconds left, so well done. I'm going to write down your time now. <laughs> that is a good start and a really nice way to start the session, actually, George. So thank you. Um, firstly, that strong message calling out for collaboration and repurposing, which we talked about a huge amount yesterday. And I think it's great to see companies like yourselves really looking to, to reach out to other people to, to help drive things forward. That's perfect. And and secondly, actually introducing different ways that you can come up with repurposing ideas. Uh, so really appreciate that. That's fantastic. Um, have you got any quick examples of, of how you have interacted with patients organizations so far or kind of some of the things that you, you really have taken from those uh, interactions? Uh, yeah, so I've got interactions all, all across the spectrum. Um, so, you know, there's, there's patient networks that are really well organized and, and, and they help us in every way possible. And I mean that they provide scientific advice. They, they tell us which are the, you know, the trusted labs. Uh, it, it, they're very, very, uh, very good with us. And we actually get to meet people and we get to talk about not not only on the business level, but on the personal level as well. Uh, but this of course does help both ways because 
Uh, you get a particular disorder, and the way it's described in the literature isn't always um, isn't always as clear as you'd like to think. So, when, for example, something uh, uh, when one of the phenotypes is more important, but you're not aware of it when looking at all the databases and all the sources that you actually have, or when a symptom is more important than something else, when when the current medication has too many side effects. So, you know, there's a uh, there's a lot to take away, and I have to say that uh, that there's definitely uh, I think we, we talked about this yesterday as well during one of the one of the breakout sessions. There's definitely better and worse, uh, uh, better organized and worse organized uh, uh, patient networks. But I definitely think that uh, that there's definitely a push for people to actually start to to, to gather. Uh, they, as I said, they help with everything from from scientific advice all the way to patient recruitment for trials. So uh, really good experience so far, and I hope to have more. That's, that's fantastic. Really good to hear, George, and thank you for that. I appreciate it. A really nice way to start the session, and, and thank you for thank you for thank sharing you. with us. Um, so from, from that talk, which was really ended beautifully talking about collaboration, we're moving to a, another talk, which I, I guess will also centre very much on the ideas of collaboration, but looking at things at this different scale. And as I, as I mentioned at the start, we want to look at really the, the macro down to the, the micro perspective in this session. And, and I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by Kelly Gray, uh, who is the Open Innovation Program Manager at AstraZeneca, a, a name we're all familiar with over the last year, after the last year, and uh, a company that's, you know, one of the really big players in the pharmaceutical industry. So Kelly, thanks for joining us. And, and Kelly will be chatting to us about the AstraZeneca Open Innovation Platform, um, integrating external and internal ideas to enable science through collaboration. Kelly, welcome and thank you. Thanks, Rick, and thanks to everybody at Find a Cure for the kind invitation to come and speak. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about our Open Innovation Programme and also about the ways that we have undertaken repurposing, repositioning trials, both within AstraZeneca, external to AstraZeneca, and within our team, um, uh, Emerging Innovations. So I heard something on the radio the other day, I'm just gonna digress slightly. And Chris Evans was talking about um, innovation and he said about how he believes it to be kind of the reinvention of an idea as opposed to the start of something new. And I think that really does speak to what our open innovation program tries to do. So to deliver the next generation of medicines, we really, feel that we have to find ways to be able to combine our science internally at AstraZeneca with the best external science. And what we've tried to do from uh, 2015 when the program launched in its, in its current format is seek to share research tools, data and expertise so that we can really enable that scientific collaboration with the overarching goal of bringing benefit to patients. The great thing about our program is that we're able to act within quite a broad scope we don't have to be um, aligned with the core therapy areas and we can work um, a bit disease agnostically, really thinking about rare diseases and diseases with very high unmet need. So I like to share this little cartoon, really, and it, it's just two folks sitting here thinking, oh, you know, this really is an innovative approach, but I'm afraid we really can't consider it because it's never been done before. And what we kind of think with our programme is that if it really is an innovative approach, it's probably a brilliant idea. And we kind of move barriers to try and make those ideas come to fruition because they're quite often the ones that provide the greatest benefit both to patients, organisations and scientists and clinicians. So AstraZeneca sees the value of collaboration. And in 2020, um, we had 1400 active collaborations across the globe. Most of these were centered in the US, Europe and the UK. And they, they took various formats with joint research centers, with academia, we innovate with biotechs that are, have got innovative new startup ideas. And we also partner with other industries um, in the early pre-competitive space. So the overarching mission of the Open Innovation Programme is to create a permeable research environment in order to access the best science, no matter where it's happening, so that we can inevitably deliver life-changing medicines to patients. The way our programme is currently set up is that we have six modules that we have on the Open Innovation website. And these consist of a clinical compound bank, a preclinical toolbox, uh, the target innovation module, cell therapy, CoSolve and the data library. And these six modules really feed into our three main goals, 
which is firstly to impact the AstraZeneca portfolio. So we want to be able to collaborate so that we can advance innovative new medicines, bringing new treatments to patients in the clinic. We really want to be able to demonstrate scientific leadership. So by committing to leading in science through collaboration, and then finally to access external scientific expertise. So forging partnerships with leading researchers around the globe so that we can address key scientific challenges that we may not have the resource or expertise to target ourselves internally. So why is the programme attractive? It, you could think, oh, well, this is, you know, I can see the benefit to AstraZeneca, but what's the, what's the benefit to external scientists? And we really like to think of the programme as a bit of a win-win. It's not just about one party getting a lot out of the collaboration. So, for example, the Clinical Compound Bank offers 10 clinical ready compounds. And so by clinical ready, I mean that these have been into at least a phase one trial. They have a full safety and tox package and the external scientists can submit a proposal which will be reviewed internally. And for AstraZeneca, if this is seen as something that would be good to move forward, we have the potential to be able to access newly clin new clinically validated projects and data. For the preclinical toolbox, we really take that step back. So we offer 40 mechanistic tool compounds, which have reached the candidate selection stage. Again, many of these may have been into a phase one trial and they have a safety and tox profile. And what we would really like investigators to do there is come up with an interesting hypothesis in their area of expertise so that they can explore novel disease biology with a pharmacol pharmacological agent, which really has good efficacy and safety profiles. So really moving the science forward. So from a target innovation perspective, we offer high quality compound screening sets up to 250,000 compounds in our libraries. And we really see this as a collaboration. So we work with external scientists to understand what they're trying to do. We do some of the data analysis for them. And what we're really hoping is that that will lead to new target generation or new lead identification projects, which can either be um, brought back into the AstraZeneca portfolio or can be um, explored externally with the expertise of the external investigator. So last year, we launched a new initiative called CoSolve, which is really a crowdsourcing initiative. So we went to the therapy areas and we asked them what their challenges are, what their biggest project problems are. And we reached out and we ran a series of challenges whereby we want people in the external research community to come to us with their innovative ideas to solve those problems. And in a 12 to 18 month time frame, we want to enter into a collaboration that will really push their technology over the line and be able to deliver a novel solution for the current challenges that we face. We've also we also recognize that data is the new the new asset, really. So as it was just mentioned in the last talk, we can take all different types of data and we offer access to unpublished preclinical data sets in the hope that novel ideas can be mined from that existing data to think about new repositioning hypotheses or new safety um, algorithms that can predict the safety and efficacy of molecules moving into the clinic. And finally, we've got a cell therapy module whereby we, we tap into both the target innovation and the preclinical toolbox to be able to think about generating new regenerative medicine approaches. And what we hope for the external scientists is that this generates novel data for publications and advances medical science. And from an AstraZeneca perspective, we're able to push the boundaries of science with the potential to deliver new life-changing medicines. So the AstraZeneca program really has benefited patients over the last six to seven years in which it's been running. So we've had more than 31 approved or ongoing completed clinical studies in new indications. We've uh, undertaken over 400 preclinical validation studies, which has led to enhanced understanding of target or disease biology. 75 novel targets have been evaluated for diseases with high unmet medical need. We've added over 30,000 new compounds to the screening library to really enhance the diversity of those molecules. And we've also run 17 mini R&D challenges, which have looked to bring in novel solutions to complex problems and new collaborations. So that's just the general overview of the programme as it currently stands. But I know that everybody on the, on, in the meeting is interested in how this actually relates in, in reality to drug repurposing. 
And so I briefly mentioned that we have entered into just over 31 phase two completed ongoing or approved studies. And what we try to do from an AstraZeneca perspective is support those studies by covering the drug, drug costs um, and providing the materials for the clinical trial. 26 of those studies um, have been funded externally through grant funding or consortiums, and four have been actually funded internally by AstraZeneca. On the right here, you can see kind of a broad range of indications that have um, been involved in these studies. And I've tried to highlight in blue the ones that fall under the rare disease category. And as you can see, although it's not it's not an insignificant proportion of those trials. So you can see that we do have quite a broad range of studies that we're interested in pursuing, just really purely to bring benefit to patients. So I guess what factors affect a repositioning study? Strategically, it would be great to be able to say, let's just go after every indication that we can think of. We've got the compound, we know the mechanism, let's just do it. But in reality, that just can't be the case. And I'm sure that was covered yesterday in some of the talks. Oh, just trying to get that out of the way. So we really think about five key factors. And this, this applies both to um, rare diseases, but also in general to, to the pipeline. So we really base everything, every decision is based on the strength of the scientific hypothesis within AstraZeneca. And what we've tried to do more recently is systematically integrate multiple approaches to knowledge generation. And so I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. What we're also trying to think about more is maintaining the pipeline through pre-positioning of assets, so life cycle management. As it was touched on in the, in the lightning talk there, you've got nine times greater likelihood of being able to kind of reposition a molecule as opposed to starting a program from scratch if you have the right kind of factors in place. So it's something we're constantly thinking about is how can we really maximize the potential of every new medicine that's coming through the pipeline. The third thing that we think about is really identifying the medical need and whether as part of that we have access to and the ability to recruit patients with that specific disease indication. And as part of that, we really want to be able to prioritize clinical outcomes that enable development decisions. There's no point in entering into a clinical trial that reads out at the end and doesn't give you the information that you require to be able to take that next step forward. The fourth thing we have to think about is developing a business case for internal funding. I've got to be honest, the bar is high. If we take a repositioning hypothesis to an internal investment decision meeting, we have to be able to compete with the therapy area aligned strategies and, and business cases that are being put forward. So it has to be a very strong business case. We also need to be able to identify and apply for grant funding. So whether that be from external organizations, and then also think more recently about creatively utilizing venture type funding models, because the challenges for grant funding are extremely difficult. And then finally, we need to think about the IP. So do we have enough IP left in that asset to be able to drive the project forward? Or do we have the potential and scope to be able to generate new IP? So be that a formulation, a dosing regime, or a new indication. So all things that we have to think about. So one of the things more recently that we've been working on is really systematically integrating most multiple approaches to knowledge generation. And we've been developing over the last four to five years a type of repositioning engine that uses drug signatures. And just to talk you through it, so what we've been doing is taking both terminated and live assets from the internal programs and generating RNA-seq data to generate drug transcript profiles, which you can see on the, on the top there. So if you just imagine that that's a, a gene profile for a cell that's been treated with a drug. We then are able to connectivity map that with a disease multiomic profile with our collaborator over in the US, Joel Dudley. And so what they try and do is complementary disease match the drug with the disease to identify a potential match. And the output of that is new repositioning hypotheses that can then undergo experimental validation. I guess in the past, these types of new repositioning hypotheses have been very much biased towards the scientist or investigators knowledge and experience around disease, diseases and mechanisms of action. 
But what this repositioning engine really gives us is an unbiased approach to hypothesis generation. So we're not just getting all of the very well-known diseases, but we are actually generating hypotheses in diseases that we would never have thought about before. We then go back to the literature to make sure that that makes sense, as was previously mentioned. And then we can work through a plan to try and try and get that pro, um, experimental process working through the stages of the drug discovery pipeline. So one example of how we've implemented this process is we really thought about um, sericatinib in IPF. So IPF falls under the rare disease category and it's a progressive fibrosis of the lung parenchyma with a poor prognosis. So a five year survival rate of around 20%. It's got orphan disease designation in the US and it's poorly served by the drugs that are currently on the market. And what we found when we delved into the kind of transcriptomic analysis that was that sericatinib had a number of antifibrotic effects on multiple pathogenic pathways in IPF. So with this in mind, we decided to embark on a kind of preclinical study and AstraZeneca and the Emerging Innovations team invested a lot of time and effort in doing an in vitro and in vivo preclinical package to be able to really show that this sericatinib IPF hypothesis had legs really. We also established a collaborator network with Joel Dudley and, and other collaborators in the US who are experts in the IPF field. And so what, we've, what we moved forward was we took it internally to try and get an investment decision for a phase two trial. And unfortunately that wasn't viewed favorably. So we went to a different method of trying to fund the study. So we went to the NIH, which has got an NCATS program for new therapeutic uses for existing molecules. So working both with internal teams and the collaborator network that we'd established, we were successful in achieving grant funding to be able to take this into a phase 1b 2a trial to develop a biomarker strategy and proof of concept study. And that clinical trial is currently ongoing. So I guess funding is a huge part of whether a, a study can go forward. And really there's two mechanisms for funding, internal and external. So internally for us, the only way we're gonna get a repositioning study funded if, it, if it's aligned with the core therapy areas within AstraZeneca. So cardiovascular, renal and metabolism, respiratory and immunology, oncology, or in some cases, neuroscience. The bar is really high, so quite often, We've gone to external sources to work with external collaborators. We offer letters of support. We work with the investigators to generate the grant proposals. And quite often having an industry partner does give you a more favorable review with the funding bodies. So we can look to charities, so Welcome or National Organization for Rare Diseases, which have funding mechanisms for clinical studies. And there's also the government programmes such as the NIH and the NCATS grant. And in the UK, the Medical Research Council will have a number of calls for repositioning type studies. But also, more recently, consortium type approaches where these can be cross pharma, cross academic industry. And these are actually a really useful way to get studies off the ground, particularly if in rare diseases you have limited access to patient populations by having multiple collaborators across multiple countries. You're actually able to access and recruit patients in a much more um, efficient way. But we also know that there's challenges of grant funded clinical research programs, although we are heavily reliant on them. The timelines from proposal to funding is long, and then obviously the clinical trial takes another year, 18 months, two years after that. And sometimes we find that although the funding is sufficient to conduct the basic level of research that we need, it's not sufficient to conduct the robust studies that would then lead to an investment decision to move that, that indication forward. A lot of the studies are limited to one academic site, which can result in enrollment delays. And then the studies may not generate data that sufficiently increases the value of programs. So they either have to be run again, or they're just decided that it's, there's not sufficient information there. And it also means that the rigidity of grant funding, i.e. you have to do what you've, been, you've asked them for, means that there's not really much room for maneuver and, and agility within, within that clinical program. So what we've tried to do is think more creatively around funding clinical research programs. And at the end of 2019, we actually signed an agreement with St. George's Street Capital. Um, and this was an emerging innovations team 
initiative where we took two OI compounds and we pitched a series of repositioning opportunities to St George's Street. This is a type of charity that are able to source investments and their aim is to fast track clinical trials. And we share a common value that we're trying to accelerate vitally needed medicines into clinical practice. So following a pitch session of around five or six new indications, St George's Street licensed two assets from us. Um, they've taken AZD 50, 1656 into a COVID-19 trial, which has just wrapped up in April of this year. They're also looking to take an MPO inhibitor into uh, idiopathic male infertility, which should kick off towards the end of this year. And what we're hoping is that this sets a precedent and that we'll be able to continue funding clinical research programs for repositioning hypotheses to actually get medicines to patients with high unmet need. So it's my belief, and hopefully I have convinced you in some way, that open innovation collaborations are advancing science and medicines discovery. Um, repositioning through open innovation holds great potential for bringing medicines to patients with current unmet need. And by bringing together the tools and expertise of AstraZeneca scientists with external scientists and clinicians, we think that we increase the possibility of success. However, we do understand and we are constantly trying to overcome challenges associated with funding, access to patients and timelines, which all pose significant hurdles that have to be overcome to enhance the probability of success. And so I just want to give like a little shout out to the amazing team at Emerging Innovations and Open Innovation. So many of the people in the Emerging Innovations team feed into the Open Innovation Programme. Hitesh heads up our Emerging Innovations team and Pam Hill leads the Open Innovation Programme. Andrew's our clinical scientist or clinician and Adrian Dong, Rebecca, David and David. You have to be called David to work in the team. Um, all, all provide a lot of insight, great translational biologists. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you. And if anyone's got any questions, uh, please ask them. Kelly, thank you so much. It was really interesting to see how it all pieces together and you went into some great detail there, which I really appreciate it. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I could ask a million questions and I probably will. <laughs> I that. think uh, what I liked generally about it is it, it feels interesting that you're almost creating an academic style um research system within industry itself and then using some of the approaches yeah. academics are using and also then trying to find ways to more simply feed it into that industry pathway which is yeah. fascinating actually as, a, as an approach and i really like some of the um innovative approaches you're trying to use into the funding side of things and i think there's things that a lot of people in academia could look at or in the broader community could look at to, to learn from that so that was amazing um there are different ways that you pour into this platform as a standard so um one of the audiences asking what what the the general method is you're using to choose which disease to put through the process and I guess that would vary dependent upon whether it's an approach from an academic an approach from internal so could you just go give it another sense of that as, again yeah so internally we have the emerging innovations team and we come up with kind of clinical repositioning hypothesis just as a part of our role so we put together a kind of preclinical study and can move that through um through various funding opportunities by identifying external academics who have expertise. We work with those guys. If you're an external investigator and you would like to tap into the program, you can visit the website and basically either connect with us through the contact us page and we're always happy to chat. What, what we would say and what put, sets us apart, I think, from some of the other industry open innovation programs is that we want it to be a collaboration. We don't want to give you compound or data and have you run away and never hear from you again. We really want you to tap into the expertise and, and tools that we have so that we can really get the best possible chance of success. So you can visit the website, have a look at all the offerings there, and then you can submit a proposal or you can reach out to us directly and we can have a conversation and we can pull in different people from across the organization to really work through the process with you. That's amazing, Kelly. And, and, and adding on to that, you know, we have seen cases in our community where, um, research has really been spearheaded or, or funded from the, the, the patient group or the charity side. I mean, have there been approaches from that type of audience into AstraZeneca? And is that something that you, you could look at, provided they had a, an academic collaborator in place? We, we could 100% look at that. If somebody comes to us, so we don't offer funding through the programme. We tend to work with external groups to try and secure funding. So yep. like I said, letter of support, help with a grant proposal, that kind of thing. 
Um, and there are specific industry academic funding bodies, which you can only have if you've got an industrial partner. So it's all about the conversation. If you came to us with the money in place to run the study, then that 100% is something that would be would be fantastic. And yeah, that would be great. That's, that's great. And then the final thing I just want to touch on is uh, you mentioned this ability to look outside of those core disease areas with this platform. Yeah. I just wondered why that is something that is considered within the organisation from your perspective and if you think that's something you might might grow in the future. So I think that's that's the beauty of the programme. So we, we want to, we realise that mechanisms span across disease areas. Just because AstraZeneca has the four main focus areas, it doesn't mean that these assets can't be useful for other indications. And I think what we want is to put the patients first. Really, if we can get a medicine to a patient in a rare disease because the mechanism is shared, we can move kind of heaven and earth to try and do that. So, and because we're not tied in, the funding is generally external. We don't have to necessarily answer so many questions around why we're doing this study. If all we're offering is kind of an in-kind contribution of the compound and the external expertise. So we we have um, studies going on in kind of spinal cord injury or Huntington's. They're not core disease areas, but they're they're patients that need need a medicine. They need a therapy. So that's why the scope of the program is fairly broad. Kelly, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed your talk, and I think it's uh, it's great to get that perspective on how these uh, open collaborative platforms are working in the top of industry. So thanks for sharing. Really thanks appreciate it. Um, right, so we're going to move on to the next of our brave lightning speakers now, and I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Ivo Timmermans to the stage. So Ivo is uh, CEO of Pleco Therapeutics. Um, so welcome, Ivo. And he's going to be taking our exciting challenge uh, to talk to us about Plecoid therapy, a novel approach to treat cancer. So Ivo, I don't know your camera's enabled, if you could pop that uh, on. There, I, think, I, th I think my camera is not enabled to uh, register oh, oh. do not worry if oh, we can share oh. your slides we'll see something that's absolutely fine i can always put my face here to to, to mime it if you need me to well, um i'll share my screen that's thank you Ivan. can you see it uh... we can indeed that's perfect okay. okay thanks for the introduction yes my name is Ivo timmermans i'm uh, the ceo of clinical therapeutics and i i'm happy to share with you an example of a project that's breaking new grounds it all started for our company and I'm hoping the scrolling works. Yeah, it all started for a company a few years ago when a researcher at a well-known MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston looked at the samples of her patients with acute myeloid leukemia, and she found that there was a high level of toxic metals in the blood and bone marrow. And very importantly, she also found that these high level of toxic metals led to inferior survival. Just to give you an example here, if patients are admitted to hospital, you measure blood. Those who have a high cadmium concentration in the blood, as uh, represented here by the red line, did over time um, much worse than patients with a low cadmium in their blood. And cadmium is just an example because we have these uh, data from, from actually about a dozen uh, metals. And not only essential, not only toxic metals, but also essential metals where a lower concentration leads to poor survival. So the investigator, Dr. Ohanian, she designed a metal scoring system where she selected 10 metals, five toxic metals and five essential metals. And if a metal was out of range, then she would assign a point to them. So uh, it is very clear that um, if you look at uh, the graph on the right-hand side, that if people have an abnormal score and only one, two or three metals, they do relatively well over time. And if they have uh, an abnormal value in more than six of those 10 metals, then they have the worst uh, prognosis. So it also uh, uh, shows that uh, AML can be seen as a multi-metal disorder. And that raises the question, what happens if you, ex if you extract toxic metals and um, would that have an effect on disease uh, progression? Well, that's exactly what, uh, what happened. The investigators at MD Anderson took the concept to the clinic and they made a mixture of, uh, they, they um, made a mixture of components that, that addressed the metal balancing in the patients. And in a way they test the prototype of what we as Plico do as, uh, uh, as, as uh, intended commercial products. 
Now, two years into the studies, we look at the uh, interim results and they are nothing short but amazing. We, we see in patients uh, uh, an 85% complete remission rate after one cycle, and that is compared to about 40% that you might expect with uh, a match control in uh, best care chemotherapy. And also the remission rate, high remission rate, uh, translates into uh, long-term survival, where we see the first uh, results now, and we see an almost doubling of, of the uh, survival uh, time for the average patient. So it basically um, shows the concept and that it's clinically viable to extract metals and that it has a, a positive effect on disease progression. And that is also the basis for our product development. We at Plico define, uh, are developing a completely new product category and we call them Plicoid agents. And the agents, as well as the company, are named after the aquarium fish Plicostomus, which is a fish that cleans the glass of the aquarium from the insides. And, and that is basically how our compounds uh, work. And we are fine tuning our products to fix those combinations of chelators that extract the metals and antioxidants that uh, facilitate the transport of the metals from the cells. And our products are designed to detoxify the tumor microenvironment and thus boosting existing chemotherapy and not to replace it. And we are developing thereby first-in-class products that addresses one of the roots of cancer and not uh, just the tumor itself. Now, chelating agents are used to extract metals and they are small molecules. They bind to metals. Uh, here on the right-hand side, you see a picture from Wikipedia. In the middle, you see an, uh, an iron, which is iron, and that is uh, connecting to two molecules of differentiox, standard iron uh, chelator. And that makes it uh, a chemically inert uh, composition, and thus the iron is escorted out of the body by urine or, or uh, via bile. And this is actually how chelating agents work. In our case, we're looking at a multi-metal disorder, and we need to combine a few of those chelating agents because a single agent cannot extract all those metals that we want to extract. So our research is aimed at extracting those toxins, but also at sparing the essential metals. And, and in our perception, we divide the metals in three groups. And the, on the right-hand side, you see the toxic group, cadmium, mercury, arsenic, lead, etc. And on the left-hand side, you see essential metals that are necessary for simple physiological functioning. And iron and copper are a category of their own. They're essential, but in high concentrations, they display toxic effects. So it is a fine balancing act to get the product uh, get a product together. Now, if, if you can start wrapping up, please. Eva, okay. Thank you. Yeah, in, we, we are um, looking at uh, compounds that are available on the market. One of them is DMPS, and we look at effects uh, in cells and see how effective we can chelate. Next, we also um, uh, combine uh, chelating agents, uh, DMSA and MIA DMSA, for instance, is a, one, of, one of an example of uh, such an effective combination. You see that there is a reinforcing effect of the pairs. Now, our concept is working in many diseases, uh, not only leukemia, AML, but also small cell lung cancer. We have a project and we're looking at rolling out the concept in uh, many areas. And my last slide challenges, there's a technical development challenge where um, entering new fields of science where we don't have a standard model that mimics metal toxicity. So we have to build uh, models of our own. Route to the market is uh, complex because we touch upon uh, several uh, mechanisms, often recombination therapy. And also if you, if you build up a mixed dossier, then we look at ingredients that are sometimes neglected or have no active uh, work or publications for a number of decades. And, lo and lastly, if you want to secure funding, there's a sort of uh, for orphan or for um, repurposing products that you can't defend them properly, which is which is not correct. And for investors, repurposing is not always considered sexy. So, so that's something we have to fight. So, so thanks for your uh, attention. Yeah. 
Evo, thank you so much. Uh, it's really interesting and it's nice to see um, that kind of fusion of a really innovative approach to tackle a condition with using, you know, existing compounds and repurposing to drive it forward. Also, as a, 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 a historical zoologist, great to see a fish reference in any talk, so good job there. <laughs> um, right, thank you for sorry, that. Yeah. I think I had a problem with my microphone, yes. No, no, sorry, no. Rick. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just, just thanking you for um, uh, a really interesting talk. I enjoyed it. Um, we're going to have to roll on from now, but if there are any further questions for Evo that come through the chat, then I'll make sure we pass them on to you, Evo. And please do reach out to him directly through the um, SwapCard platform as well. But thank you so much, Evo, for a great talk. Um, right. We're going to move on now to uh, the next part of our program. Um, and this is kind of going from where we've looked so far at some of the uh, the the bigger picture things, the conceptualization, how do you come up with a repurposing opportunity? How can you then look at repurposing at that big macro level to, to really the smaller scale and how the clinicians on the ground and the patients themselves are impacted by drug repurposing trials. Uh, now, probably back at my first conference, which I guess is six years back now, we had a talk um, by one of Dr. Rob Semple, our next speaker's colleagues, uh, uh, Vicky Parker, uh, talking about some of the work these guys were doing in um, segmental overgrowth. And I'm really pleased to say we can come back and revisit that story now, uh, looking at the, the story from both the, the clinician and research perspective with, with Prof. Rob Semple and uh, following him, uh, Mandy, who I'll introduce later. Um, so for now, I'm, I'm really Glad to have you here, Rob. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, and uh, Rob is currently the Professor of uh, Translational Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, the work he's been doing in progressing from gene towards new treatment uh, lessons from a decade in PROS. So Rob, welcome and please do take it away. Thanks so much. Can you can you see the screen OK? Can you hear me as well? Absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. Splendid. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to talk here this morning and and um, uh, as Rick said, very much, I, I'm not speaking as an expert in, in repurposing. I'm, I'm speaking as a particular type of doctor who occupies the rare disease ecosystem. So um, I, I'm interested in genetic disease and I have quite a lot of experience over the years in finding new rare disorders, finding new genetic diagnoses and improving diagnostics and patient counselling. Um, but although we always undertake genetic diagnostics, hoping to find uh, an immediate and obvious uh, new drug target, usually that's not the case. Usually it's much more complex. And this particular condition um, uh, was, a, was a striking exception. And that led to a, a lot of engagement with the uh, therapeutic and repurposing world over the last 10 years, which has taught me an awful, an awful lot. So this is very much a personal perspective of, uh, of that decade. And this all started when uh, Mandy was sent down to us when I worked in Cambridge. And Mandy can speak much more eloquently than I can about her about her life experience. So, uh, and she'll also show some uh, some much nicer photographs than this very solemn clinical photograph, which uh, which we had taken and which Mandy was uh, kind enough to let us use. But but it demonstrates to you that that Mandy's problem has been. Uh, lifelong excessive growth of her legs, apparent at birth and, and progressive during the rest of her life, and an increasing challenge to her, contrasting with a very thin upper body. And as for many people with rare disease, she had had a lifelong odyssey of going to see different clever specialists um, who had many clever hypotheses, but, but no explanation could be offered or proven. Uh, and she arrived at us really just as technology was for the first time allowing us to, um, to be bolder than had been possible before using exome based sequencing. And rather than sequencing DNA from her blood cells, we said, well, clearly the bottom half of Mandy's body is different from the top half. And so we ought to look at them separately. And so we sequenced all the genes in her, uh, in a biopsy from her arm and her leg. And we asked the question whether or not there was something that was different about her leg. And we had a very striking and very clear answer, which um, was, uh, it was immediately clear to us, uh, did explain the problem. And, and this was a change in a gene called pic 3 ca which we found in Mandy's leg. You can see this overlapping peak here, but not in her arm. And we were very confident this, this was the answer because this is a very well-studied gene involved in regulating tissue growth. And we very quickly um, asked around the country and around the world for uh, other people who had vaguely similar problems. And we were able to find a group of other patients with collaborators in the US who also had this change. And so that is enough in the genetic world to have proven a new disease entity. 
And we also studied cells and demonstrated that at a time when there shouldn't be any cell growth, you can perhaps just see from this tiny shadow here, which shouldn't be there at all, that we had biochemical evidence as well, that this was a problem caused by a growth pathway being turned on all the time. Now, the main reason that we had such confidence in this was because the pathway had been extensively uh, studied over the prior two decades because of its role in cancer. So for around eight years before we met Mandy, it had been clear that the very same types of mutations are among the, the commonest mutations in cancer. And actually, as we have met more and more patients with this condition as the years have gone by, it's become clear that the, the pattern of mutations we see in the gene is almost identical to what is seen in, in cancer. And so this cuts two ways. First of all, it's obviously immediately concerning to know that you have a mutation which is also common in cancer and which is called a cancer driver mutation. So the first concern was that this might mean an increased cancer risk. And curiously enough, that doesn't appear to be the case, that there is no evidence of an excess risk of cancer, with the exception of one particular rare um, childhood tumor where the kidney is affected. So, Although initially worrying, paradoxically, this became a great opportunity because of a decade of intense effort in the, in the pharma world to develop a whole variety of different inhibitors which target this signaling pathway. And I, I'm not going to go into the pathway in detail, except to say that PI3 kinase, uh, which is the enzyme which is affected, sits up at the top of this pathway, links to a lot of growth factor receptors and stimulates a lot of downstream events and the uh, red triangles indicate some, but not all, of the bits of the pathway to which clinical compounds had, uh, had been developed. And when we met Mandy, the, the field was at the stage that, uh, that most of these were uh, still in, in trials and experimental, with the exception of the mTORC inhibitors, which were very well established since the 1980s and widely used in, um, for example, post-transplant immunosuppression. So we immediately had the opportunity to look at something which was on the shelf and prescribable at once. So the obvious first thing to do was to put some serolimus or, or its related compounds, everolimus, on some cells. I'm not going to dwell on these details, but you can see quite simply that by this particular measure of growth, in a whole variety of cells, including some of Mandy's, you can see that um, this elevation of signaling at the start is turned off very nicely by Everolimus, and this, this happens extremely potently. So we had biochemical proof that we could take cells from patients with this condition, and we could turn off the, the signaling with a, a compound in clinical use. So within about um, 12 to 18 months of, of meeting Mandy, perhaps, perhaps two years, we were able to persuade some of the NHS doctors looking after her that it was worthwhile trying a, a low dose of serolimus based on all that we know about its um, risks and benefits. So, so this was not a, a formal trial. This was N equals one uh, compassionate clinical use. And Mandy started some serolimus in around September 2012. And what we measured in particular using DEXA imaging was the amount of extra fat tissue in her legs. These are just some of our, our, our DEXA images here. And, and Mandy herself will speak to the fact that not only did we measure a very dramatic subsequent loss of the extra tissue growth, which actually had meaningful impact on some of the things that were important to Mandy in her, in her daily life, such as mobility and, uh, and the way her prostheses fit. Um, um, and, and so this was, this was very impressive. And all of this was achieved at very, very low levels of serolimus. And we use low levels even below the levels which were thought to be important for immunosuppression, because that's what our cellular studies suggested was worthwhile. So this was extremely encouraging. This suggested that it might be possible not just to um, turn off further growth, but also to cause regression of existing growth. But in the background, we, we had to do a lot of work with colleagues around the world to actually work out what this new disease was. And, uh, and the answer was that um, these very same mutations explain an extraordinarily wide variety of clinical syndromes, which were formerly thought to be distinct. And that's because this is a mosaic disorder. This is not an inherited disorder. Um, only some parts of the body have the mutation. And so it can look extraordinarily diverse. There, there is some role of the mutation, but the biggest determinant is where in the body the mutation is. So the very same mutation can cause a large leg or overgrowth of the face or, or the brain. And so um, we went through a lot of work with colleagues um, collating and describing all the types of conditions where PIK3CA mutations occurred. 
Uh, and this led to progressive work where we coined this new entity, the PIC3ECA related overgrowth spectrum. But this is more heterogeneous than almost any other genetic disorder that you might imagine. And that has a lot of implications for the way downstream studies are, are, are conducted. Um, and the purpose of uh, putting all this machinery in place and, uh, and building cohorts and networks and, and study cohorts um, numbering into the thousands internationally was, of course, to try to move towards um, clinical trials to follow up on our experience with, with Mandy. So I told you already about Sirolimus. And uh, among the, the wide portfolio of other agents, we, we focused very much on the selective inhibitors of the gene that had gone, that had gone awry. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about alpelizib uh, later on, although actually that's, that's not one of the agents we were able to get. So our strategy was to target all the most selective inhibitors, um, use the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the conduits which the pharma companies provided to, to apply for use of these. And we had a two-step strategy where, first of all, we wanted to demonstrate that they worked in cells, and then we wanted to take the most promising compounds and go back and dangle these to try to engage pharma, uh, perhaps naively, in the... Uh, in, in uh, clinical trials. And so all these compounds were designed because they turn off the pathway. So it was very obvious that we would find that in our cells. And indeed, that's what we found to be the case. This is some data using uh, uh, Tazelazib, Genentech compound, showing that it very nicely turns off the pathway. Quite simply, these, these uh, dark bands shouldn't be here. And adding a low dose of the Genentech compound made it all disappear. But it was also becoming clear that we have particular challenges in this group of conditions um, for trials. And um, in particular, we don't know exactly which bits of the problems are reversible and which bits are, are, are fixed by the time we meet affected patients. And, and that problem, which I mentioned of anatomical heterogeneity is, is a huge concern. And, uh, and, and it means that almost no two patients look alike at all. And so you need to, to assemble a very large network of patients in order to pick a subgroup within those where you can measure something meaningful. Um, as we engaged in further studies with pharma, a, a, a very uh, important factor was the lack of the, the general lack of toxicology studies in, in children and often lack of pediatric formulations, which I think is a general issue, of course, in, in rare disease research. Uh, and that was particularly true for the compounds which we were looking at, which generally were being trialed in adult solid malignancies such as, such as breast cancer. Um, and I've touched already on, on um, our efforts to build capacity and networks for trials. So in the last few years, we've, we've engaged in, in a few trials. So, so first of all, um, we couldn't really power a, a trial reliably based on our experience of Sirolimus to date. So we, we ran a, a pilot study in, in which Pfizer provided Sirolimus to us, and we sort of uh, cast around our grants and, and, and ran the rest of a, a trial on, on a shoestring. And that taught me several things. That taught me that running clinical trials, even if they're very simple, is enormously hard work with a high bureaucratic burden. Um, and um, that's, it, it's not something to be done lightly. And that's something which was possible only because of Vicky, who, who Rick mentioned, mentioned before, who had a real enthusiasm and appetite for, for engaging in the hand-to-hand -hand combat of, of running a trial. And we looked at 30 patients together with um, colleagues in France and America. And, and to cut a long story short, using the same sort of measures of extra tissue growth, we had a very weakly positive effect where, whereby on average, we could see a minor reduction in the short term of tissue growth. But certainly nothing which looked to be of the same magnitude as what Mandy had experienced. Now that doesn't mean that what we found with Mandy was not real. It simply may well speak to the heterogeneity of this condition, but it was very invaluable in, in informing us about study endpoints um, and in about likely effect size for larger trials. But all in all, um, it was much less exciting than we'd initially hoped. And I should say that Sirolimus doesn't target the precise enzyme which is inactive and the experience of its use in cancer trials also has been that there are many ways in which cells can bypass this effect if you don't target exactly the right compound. So we then went back to the companies who provided us with experimental compounds and tried to make the case using their routine channels um, for uh, further engagement with running clinical trials. And that, and that was very hard work, I have to say. And uh, we experienced quite a bit of polite enthusiasm or, 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 or frank refusals. And this, this was surprising to us because we thought this was such a slam dunk case, having a condition solely caused by activation of a compound. 
uh, of a gene where there were compounds specifically developed against that. But of course, from the pharma point of view, they are inundated with such requests, they, they tell me. And also they were looking after uh, drug assets, which were still very much in play for, for big indications such as, such as cancer. And what struck us very most was that rather than just submitting applications through the usual channels, actually there was nothing quite like person-to-person -person contact and making the case individually. And it was with uh, Genentech Roche that we, that we had the first enthusiasm. Um, and they picked up the case and, and batted for it internally and actually agreed to, to fund a further pilot study of Tizelizib, one of their um, PI3 kinase in inhibitors. In the end, the conduct of this study passed over to colleagues in France as I moved institution. Um, and again, to, to cut a long story short, Tazelazib um, did show some benefits um, in some patients, quite marked benefits in terms of quality of life, um, bleeding and other complications of the condition, although the average effect didn't reach significance. And that's partly because the trial had to be terminated because of severe adverse events which um, we now believe is because this is not an entirely specific inhibitor, but it interferes with a different isoform of the enzyme which is involved in the immune system. Um, so it speaks to the importance of really, really focusing on the pharmacology at the start when you have such a clear trial. Now, the big news in the field um, actually came from the use of a further inhibitor, Alpelizib, which is an, a cleaner inhibitor from Novartis. Uh, and this has been di disruptive and a little bit controversial in places, but this study in, uh, from a French group in Paris, um, Guillaume Cano in 2018, uh, described first of all, compassionate use of Alpelizib um, in some very severely affected patients who were um, nearly terminally ill and receiving palliative care with dramatic benefits. And they then extended the compassionate use into a further um, 17 or so patients who were much less severely affected. So this was not a registered clinical trial. And uh, uh, discussions among my rare disease colleagues give you a range of views ranging from uh, the fact that this was extraordinarily unscrupulous and unethical towards other people saying this was actually a heroically disruptive and quite appropriate and has accelerated the use of this, this medicine for these, uh, for these agents. And, uh, and you know, I fall somewhere in between the two, but I think what is clear is that this is by far the most exciting prospect that we've seen based on what is reported. But because no pre endpoints were, were specified, uh, whether efficacy or safety, we can't yet quite be sure. So anecdotes continue to give us confidence, and this is the best show in town. But there is an urgent need for clinical trials to, to follow up on this. And uh, I'm delighted to say that the, the, the study was significantly, uh, was, um, received enough traction that, that Novartis have now gone in and are on organizing a very complex international trial, which I should uh, uh, point out as a disclosure that I'm the UK chief investigator um, of, of this study, which is pharma sponsored, which will recruit 150 patients. It's still a very tricky trial design. And one other bit of reflection I have is that when dealing with people who've developed cancer drugs, it's very difficult to, to move them away from the mentality of looking for a target lesion. And in this condition where there is much more diffuse overgrowth, it's often difficult to define the target lesion. So there's a sort of cultural re-education which we're working towards around how these trials are structured. And uh, one other uh, trial which is, um, has been running since 2017 is of another compound which is several steps down the pathway and again um, this was from a company called Arcul, a smaller company who saw this as a strategic opportunity very early on and in a similar sort of trial um, are, are moving towards reporting in the next two years or so um, with some anecdotal evidence of um, efficacy. So that's more or less where we've been. So my, my reflection is that it was tremendously exciting to discover a whole new set of conditions. And not only that, to discover that they were caused by a mutation, which 10 years of previous work had developed a whole palette of compounds to. Um, it, it seems to have been slow progress to me, but actually I reflect now looking at it, there's been a lot of activity over the last 10 years. And I would divide that into four years of actually having to put the whole machinery of, uh, of networks and cohorts together, motivating and stimulating um, patient groups, including Mandy's, which has been a wonderful asset to all these efforts. And, and getting funding to, to understand the natural history. And the fact that we have not gone faster in the clinical trial phase, I think speaks as much to the 
complexity of the condition and, and the need for these networks so that we can focus on coherent groups as, as much as any, uh, as any lack of motivation. So um, now there is proper commitment and traction from uh, pharma companies running large trials. I, I do think that in the next um, five years or so, we will actually be able to back up some of these uh, more anecdotal case series with proper uh, understanding of efficacy. And out from that, I expect will ramify a lot of new opportunities for use of these for use of, use of these drugs. So I, I've reflected really as I've gone along, but um, within the rare disease ecosystem, that there are very different cultures, and I, I come from the diagnostic genetic culture, and it's it's a little bit of a, a shock to move into the world of clinical trials and anything that can be done to minimise that that barrier and to facilitate trial infrastructure is to be is to be encouraged. Um, there are also, of course, different cultures and different diseases. I've, I've talked particularly of the, the culture of, of, of cancer therapy versus rare disease therapy. Formal trials are, are very hard work. That's my own observation. They're not to be done lightly by, by willing academics on their own, uh, but they are vital. And in particular, because because anecdotes these days are amplified enormously in the social media echo chamber, and, and it potentially uh, would be possible to go Quite, quite down a, uh, quite far down a false track based on a misleading initial anecdote. Um, uh, very quickly, pro probably much more so than in previous years. Um, it's been what, fascinating hearing from Kelly's side of things, and a lot of what she said rang, rang true of my experience. And and we've uh, never failed to deal with anyone that hasn't been enthusiastic in our approaches to to pharma, but they are busy resource constrained, and I'd emphasize very much that um, everybody believes the rare disease they work on is the most important rare disease, but to, to get traction still needs good salesmanship, persistence, and person-to-person -person contact. And the, the days of doctors leading their patient groups in this venture are, are, are long, long gone. And one of the most in, in, enjoyable aspects of all of this is working with uh, patient advocacy groups um, as, as partners, um, not at all in the old fashioned doctor patient relationship, but I, I think um, I'm speaking to the converted in this in this audience. So I'll simply mention funders and in particular Vicky Parker. So one of the uh, one of the legacies of this work over the last 10 years is that Vicky found an enormous enthusiasm for trial work and actually now works in, in clinical trials and drug development as a doctor for AstraZeneca. So that's uh, that's one of the very tangible outputs for uh, for research from from this study, so I've probably been horrifically dis indisciplined with my timing, but uh, I'm very happy to take questions. I think after after Mandy's talk, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed that and a fantastic overview of the work you've done, and also your reflections personally on it, which I thought was really valuable. And I think this does. I mean, it harks back to so many of the comments that we had in the first session yesterday uh, in the, the position that people in uh, the clinical work actually find themselves in. So loads of themes there that we've pulled out, which are brilliant. And it, it does reflect actually what can happen in a, in a given rare disease when you have uh, a clinician or a few people who are really going to drill down and focus on it and how that field can then grow and, and move forward. So thank you for, for sharing that and for your work in the space. Before we go into any questions, I think it'd be really good to bring in uh, Mandy at this stage to, to, to share her story and her reflections on this. So uh, Mandy, welcome. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Uh, so Mandy Sellers, uh, patient representative for a pick related over a spectrum and uh, obviously already been featured in, in Rob's talk. And Mandy's uh, going to talk to us about her life uh, with this rare overdose condition and how repurposed drugs have helped her. Mandy, welcome. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to do this. Okay, um, where shall I start? Probably when I was born. So I was born on the 20th of February 1975 and straight away the doctors knew that there was something wrong. My legs and feet were about four or five times larger than the average baby. Um, I was actually kept in hospital for two weeks because the doctors didn't expect me to live. However, I did, and my early years, I did see several um, different types of doctors, such as vascular, plastic surgeons, orthopedic doctors, but none of them really seen a child like me before, so they just came to the loose diagnosis that I had lymphedema. So my child was pretty average, but very happy, even though I was quite late in developing learning to walk because I had a leg discrepancy of four to five inches. Once I did, there was no stopping me, and I absolutely loved playing football. Um, I attended what they call um, a special school at that particular time. Even though academically I was on the par with other students of that age, there was no kind of integration for disabled children into mainstream education. 
However, when I reached 14, thanks to one of my wonderful teachers, I was enrolled in um, a comprehensive school part time to do my GCSEs. And this was kind of like a very strange but exciting time because being at the special school, I'd kind of been sheltered really as to how people may view my condition. And I remember entering that school on the first day and the reactions I got were the reactions I've had ever since and probably the reactions I will have till the day that I die. Um, some people were curious and they asked questions, some people just accepting of the difference and some people were verbally abusive. But however, I left that school with four GCSEs, which was a first for the special school. Uh, so for myself, along with two other pupils from the special school, um, it was such a, a unique opportunity that we appeared in our local newspaper at the time. So after school, I went on to college to do art and design and other GCSEs. So I spent my weekdays studying and my weekends doing what any 18, 19 year old would do. And yes, it did involve quite a bit of alcohol, as we can see. So after leaving college, I went to the University of Wrexham in Wales to do a degree in graphic design. And this was the first time I actually left home. Academically, again, I was on a par with the rest of the students, but I was struggling physically to enjoy my independence. So I knew that sheer um, guts and determination wasn't going to get me through this part of my life. So I decided to defer my course and come home and kind of do what I thought was the right path at the time. And that was to have liposuction on my left leg. Um, the result was they took away about six pounds of excess, excess fat, which we now know constitutes a major part of my condition. But unfortunately due to inactivity, after the operation, I ended up putting £20 back on. However, £20 wasn't going to stop me and I soon found a place to live on my own. And I enrolled in several courses such as psychology, sociology and criminology. And this led me to do a degree in psychology. So I was the first and only member of our family to go to university. And I remember one funny story that it was one of those moments where you think, oh my God, I wish the ground would swallow me up. And it was during the graduation ceremony. And the audience had been told not to clap until either the class of the year had been up there and received their award. But as I went up onto the stage, there was sudden break in the silence and I turned around to see my mom stood up frantically clapping. Uh, there was her daughter was on the stage receiving this um, degree. So what followed was the whole room bursting into um, spontaneous applause. So it was a very proud moment for mom and dad, but always for myself as well. So after taking a quiet year out studying the sign language course, I wanted to become a counsellor. So three long years lay ahead. However, two years into that course, um, I woke up and my legs were tingling, but I didn't think too much about it at the time. But as I got out of the bath, the pain intensified and my legs were becoming very, very heavy. So I managed to get to the front door, unlock it and struggle back to my bed where the pain become excruciating. I've never experienced pain like that. But also I was losing feeling in my legs and not able to move. So I did end up in A&E for six hours where they tried anti-inflammatory medication, pain relief, but nothing worked. I was transferred to a different hospital under a neurologist who did test after test, but nothing showed up. Um, but at that time, I also was diagnosed with a blood disorder called protein S deficiency, which means I now take warfarin for the rest of my life. But spontaneously, and thank goodness, after six weeks of lying in a hospital bed paralysed, um, the feeling did start to come back. So I had to learn to walk again. So it wasn't until about 15 years later that I bumped into one of the neurologists who said, oh, we did find out what the problem was. You'd actually um, suffered with a spinal stroke. So like I said, I learned to walk again, got back on my counselling course and graduated as a counsellor. Um, however, my mobility was starting to decrease at that time. And I thought, now is the time. I need to try and find out what my condition is. However, my initial search, like anybody who has a rare condition, I just didn't find anything, didn't know where to turn. And unfortunately, my search again was put on hold when I was admitted to hospital for five months this time. Um, I developed blood infections, um, kidney and stomach problems, severe anemia, uh, urine infections, MRSA and foot drop. So again, I had to learn to walk. It did take a long time, but I managed to get there. But it was during this time that I actually got in touch with Tracy Whitewood Neal, who runs the uh, Proteus Syndrome Foundation in the UK. She put me in touch with Dr. Les Bizek, who's the leading authority in America of Proteus Syndrome. So when I met Les, he said, well, yeah, you may have Proteus Syndrome, but if you do, you have a very rare form of that. So that didn't really fit. So again, my search continued. 
It wasn't long after that that life took a really unexpected turn when I did some fundraising for the Proteus Syndrome Foundation and one of the local newspapers got hold of this story and ran with it. And following this, a TV production company um, found me and wanted to do um, a documentary about my life and maybe trying to help me find a diagnosis for my condition. So this led me to meet a geneticist, Dr. Susan Houston in Manchester. But yet again, fate had different ideas and 2010 brought a major change to my life. So I must warn you that the next slide is gonna be quite gra graphic. So if you're squeamish, please turn away and I will tell you when a much nicer slide is on the screen again. So after living with cellulitis infection after infection for about 12 years, um, I actually developed um, blood poisoning in the also in my left foot. This meant that I was rushed to my local hospital. However, they didn't have the expertise or the knowledge to do anything. And they basically said that if they operated, I just would not survive. But again, as fate would have it, I'd actually met with uh, Mr. Nigam, who was an orthopedic surgeon in Liverpool previous to this. And I'd actually scheduled to have the amputation of that leg in September, 2010. So the amputation went ahead and nice, nice picture back on the screen now. Um, Mr. Nigam, he saved my life. Um, it took about six months for me to be discharged from hospital and I had to learn to be independent again, but this time as a full-time wheelchair user. And that was something completely different for me. Again, the TV company um, will follow me on this particular journey and we ended up with a title which actually does what it says on the tin, which is you losing one of my giant legs. So following this in 2012, from a referral from Dr. Susan Newson in Manchester, I met with Professor Rob Semple and Dr. Vicky Parker at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge. So following biopsies taken, as Rob was explaining, from my leg, which is an affected area, and from my arm, which isn't affected, they performed DNA sequencing to compare these cells. And after some time, they did find out obviously what the condition was, and it was a single letter mutation in the PIK3CA gene. As Rob was saying, that um, now this more known as a group of conditions called PROS, P-R-O-S, which stands for PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum. So essentially it's those conditions that are affected by PIK3CA that fall under this umbrella. Some people within this um, umbrella um, have more definite diagnosis such as Clough syndrome or FIL, which is facial infiltrating lipomatosis. But for me, I don't have a specific diagnosis, so I've just come under the umbrella of pros. So actually finding out that um, they knew what my condition was and what it was caused by, I never thought in my lifetime that would come. And I wanted to celebrate, but how do you celebrate knowing what causes your rare genetic condition? Well, you get a tattoo, of course, what else? So that is a permanent reminder to me of what makes Mandy Mandy. And oh, I'm proud to be who I am. But also, since then, people, more people, sorry, have been diagnosed with a PIK3CA mutation. So it feels good to have been part of that kind of um, process, really, for diagnosing this particular condition. So really, as if that news wasn't huge enough, later in the year, the doctors told me that they'd found a medication that they thought would stop my overgrowth and potentially shrink it. And as Rob was saying, this drug was sirolimus or commonly known as rapamycin, which is commonly used um, as an anti-rejection drug for people who have had kidney transplants and more commonly used these days for um, cancer patients. They felt it would work for me as it targets the growth pathway where my gene is situated. So it blocks the signal getting through to my gene that's constantly switched on. However, I was asked to go away and think about whether I wanted to start sirolimus or not. However, there was never any doubt in my mind because the options previously, just there was nothing there and I, would there ever be anything in the future? I don't know. So I went back and said, yeah, definitely this, I want to do this. And this is where my journey with Cyrolema started. As well as like feeling of excitement, there was also kind of like the worry, would I suffer with side effects or maybe the drug wouldn't work in a person like it worked in a culture dish. But the team were confident that it would do something. But it was a very strange feeling to know that a little pill could do something to change my life and change my body, basically. So I remember taking that first dose in the hospital room in Cambridge, and it was such a nerve wracking moment. You know, would I have any initial side effects? But thank goodness I didn't. And I went away with kind of like a new sense of optimism, really. 
you know, that life was about to change for the better. And psychologically, that gave me a boost. And mentally, I was kind of willing it to work. It also gave me um, kind of like the motivation to exercise more and eat better. And maybe this would help in combination as well. I remember that none of us expected uh, much in the way of results during the next appointment, but the results were simply nothing short of amazing. I remember that the, uh, in the space of like three months, my legs had stopped growing and they'd even shrunk and I'd lost around about 10 kilograms. So this miracle medication, as I'd like to call it, continued to work for the next few years. My mobility and living independently was a lot easier. Side effects were so minimal, such things as like mouth ulcers or feeling run down, but nothing really to write home about. And of course, the, the rapid loss of the weight didn't continue like it had in the first three months, but I did continue to lose weight. So if this was the uh, end of 2017, oh, wrong slide, sorry. <laughs> and I spent the last year um, designing and creating um, a support group um, called Gold Picks, which is now a registered charity. And um, we help people throughout the world who live with a pic 3 ca mutation with psychological support maybe helping them get in contact with doctors but also financial funding um but kind of funding for things like aids and equipment and things that just make life a little bit easier for people living with this particular condition um i remember we ran our first family weekend and if i needed any extra motivation to run the charity which i don't but just seeing how those patients and children came together who had once felt so alone and it was such an amazing feeling such an invaluable experience um so this is the family weekend um so in about beginning of 2018 i'd lost about five stone in weight from my lower limbs but it was at this time I kind of noticed that the weight had become more static and over the following months my weight began to increase. I also had reoccurring pressure sores that just wouldn't heal but I was reluctant to stop taking the drug and wanted to kind of up the dose just to see what happened. However my doctors at the time weren't keen on that and I can certainly understand why because I didn't want to end up in the same situation with possible life-threatening infections. And that probably sounds quite a dramatic thing to say, but after living with pressure sores for over 20 years, I know that something small and insignificant can become from an inconvenience to a full blown infection with the space of hours where antibiotics just do not work. So really I had no choice but to stop the sirolemus. But that led to other questions. So once my sores had healed, do I go back on rapamycin at um, a higher dose, but would that um, impair my healing again? Or do I look for an alternative? Or do I just stop the sirolemus and see what it's like when it's out of my system and then maybe try it again? However, during that time, I'd spoken to a number of people who'd been in that similar situation and every one of them had said that when they started the sirolemus for the second time, it wasn't as effective as the first time round. So for me, that kind of felt like the end of the road, really, with this medication, but with no concrete plan moving forward. My kind of only hope was knowing that because my mutation is involved in cancer, there's always going to be some research and new drugs that come out that may filter down to people living with pros. But realistically, how long is that going to take? As Rob mentioned, there was a possibility of a trial in 2019, but that in this country fell through. And then we enter 2020. And I, of course, because of the pandemic, I couldn't make my usual visit to Cambridge. But I knew that my legs were growing deep down because things were getting a lot harder to mobilise and live independently. But during this time, is, um, there's a lot of talk about the drug called Apelosib and how this targets the actual pic 3 ca gene and not just the general growth pathway. So as Rob said, this drug is currently being used in breast cancer patients with amazing results. There's also been trials in other countries for pros patients using Apelosib and that has had some amazing results as well. So could this be the next answer for me, another off-label drug? I'm hoping so. So we've now reached June 2021, and I've seen, unfortunately, a marked difference in my ability to mobilise and do things. So things that were previously maybe time-consuming but easy, such as getting dressed or getting undressed, has now become such a struggle. So I'm under a new consultant at um, Christie's in Manchester to hopefully get a pelisib on compassionate use. But then... This is the uh, sticking point again is will the NHS fund a drug that isn't for my particular condition, even if it might work? 
if the NHS say no, will someone be able to go and might be halted the drugs company to get the drug directly from them? Who knows? However, I'm not a person to sit around and do nothing. And after a little bit of research, I decided to try a low GI diet. So that means cutting out a lot, lot of sugar and glucose from my diet. So there's no um, spikes in my blood sugar that could well be feeding the mutation. So I started this eating plan around about the beginning of May. And six weeks later, I'd noticed a huge reduction in my left stump from 111 centimetres in circumference to 103 centimetres in circumference. Yet, as any, any eating changes that anybody does, you know, your body does become used to it. And unfortunately now, I'm at a stage where that's plateaued and the weight's not reducing anymore. So all I can kind of hope really is that I can keep my weight stable until I get access to a Pelisib. So finally, just to kind of say that obviously anybody who lives with a rare overgrowth condition Life is always going to be uncertain, but I'll always fight for to keep my independence and to live the life that I want to. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, Mandy, thank you so much. It's uh, it's brilliant to hear your story and told uh, exceptionally well, as always. It was, it was really engaging. And I, I, the worst thing about this virtual event is you can't have applause, right? And I'm sure there'd have been a uh, significant apl applause for both of your talks there. And uh, uh, many of the things that you, you, you talked about there, Mandy, will resonate hugely with some of the people in the audience from the patient group side. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a few comments starting to come in, actually, uh, saying just that, really. I, I, I suppose the simplest place to start here is is to get both of your reflections on what you'd hope to see or where you'd hope to see this field going over the next few years in 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 these overgrowths. I mean, where would you where would you hope in ten years' time you might have been able to get to on a personal level as as both researcher and patient, and for the field as a whole and, and your, the patient that you support, Monday? I don't know if you uh, have reflections on those points. Um, I guess because. Like obviously with the drugs rapamycin and now apelosib, it's drugs that are off label for people like myself. So I would hope in the future that there isn't this battle with the NHS funding team to get it. You know, it's always that worry: will they, won't they? And it takes so long to get to the point of asking them. You know, and I, I don't want people to kind of keep going through that. To me, you know, if if it works, then give it to that patient because at the end of the day, it saves money. You know, the money spent now saves money in the future. Thanks, Mandy. And Rob? So I, I think um, the I, I, I want to know how much alpelazib or related drugs work. And uh, I think um, Mandy talked about them being amazingly effective and that, and that might be true, but um, I'm trained to be skeptical and I'm acutely aware that that's really based on anecdotes and case series at, at the moment. Um, the tremendously difficult conditions to run trials in, and, and it strikes me that we need to be more um, creative in, in, in the way that space is occupied until you can eventually have big, expensive trials. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's managed access programs um, for, for a couple of the trial agents I mentioned, and I think the way the information from those types of programs are used by regulatory authorities and by processes such as um, applying for funding on a compassionate basis, I, I think that I think some of the bars there are are too high. So, so, so in short, I, I I want to want to know if if there is an objective, concrete basis to use alpelazib, for example, with as much enthusiasm as might be suggested by the early uh, early trials. And as a doctor, I think it's very difficult to. Um, counsel patients or do the right thing for patients in the 10 years while you're waiting for that to happen as well. So, so more attention being paid to, to that intervening time, uh, I, I think is what I'd like to see. Thanks, Rob. That's appreciated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think yesterday, particularly in our first session, we touched a lot on that central role of of the clinician and the clinician who's willing to look at research to, to move the field forward. And I was kind of wondering what your reflections are and what you think um, you'd like to see to provide more support to people in your position who are you know at the coalface seeing patients treating patients are trying to find you see that need hugely every day and wanting to try and generate the evidence to really provide that robust support for treatment what what why would you like to see support coming in and what might you like to see in the system as a whole to help you reach that goal 
So I think I think it's I think it's coming along. But um, I think, as I said, even within medicine, the, the barrier is between those who diagnose things and, and give clinical care and those who, who run clinical trials. And, mm. and that's still quite a big barrier. And I think some of the infrastructure in England funded by the NIHR has has begun to reduce that barrier and facilitate things. But but I think the process which Kelly talked about of increasing dialogue between between pharma companies at an early stage and those who think they have a target is very valuable. And some of that is about debunking some naivety. I think um, I, as, as many others working in academic research, scrimping and saving to get things done, imagine that big pharma has huge pots of money and mm -hmm. simply have it within their power to run clinical trials. But obviously they've got major competing priorities and mm -hmm. clinical trials are sufficiently expensive that that's just not the case. So again, that also is a matter of partnership. So I think, um, in progressively breaking down those barriers and making sure that that the pharma are able to reach into the people finding new disease entities and and, and that is happening to some extent but that could happen much much better um, thanks rob and and then finally mandy just want to get your thoughts on that journey you've been on and what, what you've learned looking at the research uh, and, and, and the clinical perspective. How, how do you see things, how it's how the field has moved from, you know, that, that point we didn't have a clue what it was to getting a genetic diagnosis to seeing treatments move through and, and what might you think you'd like to see more of in terms of patient engagement and how patient perspective be brought into it? Do you have any reflections from that perspective? I think because like Rob said in the last 10 years, for me personally, it seems to have just accelerated really quickly because obviously for 30 plus years of my life, there was just nothing to tell me what it could be, would there be potential treatments out there? I think, as Rob was saying in his um, talk, you know, it's important to engage with patients and patient groups because we are the people that live with it. We know daily what it's like. You know, we know when we see children with the same condition, what struggles they may have. You know, so I think just collaboration is the key to everything. Because as I always say, you know, we're stronger together. And there's no doubt about that. Mandy, thank you for that. And, and thank you both. It's It's been brilliant to have you on the stage. And I'm really glad to be able to, to see that story from both perspectives. Um, Mandy, if you're able to, to drop in, have a look on the Swapcore platform, loads of great comments coming in and appreciation for, for you sharing that personal story. I think it made a big impact. So thank you for that. Um, you. Depending on how things go, I think we may have time to come back for some more general questions later, uh, which uh, I'll happy to do. But please, uh, people out there, if you'd like to reach out to Rob, to Mandy, please do find the platform connect and I'm sure I'll be happy to talk to you. So thank you both for your time. Okay, and now the not only is it a lightning talk trying to follow this, but Jess, you have to follow Mandy as well. And I, 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 I apologize for that, but I'm really excited to welcome uh, uh, Jess to the stage. Uh, so Jess Hobart is a co-chair of the uh, UK uh, Master Association Support Group. Uh, and she's bravely taken the lightning challenge, knowing full well what she's letting herself in for with regard to the, the time limit and the bell. And uh, Jess has created a beautiful snappy title for her talk, um, Think Qualies Early. So uh, Jess, I'm excited to hear your thinking on the the world of health economics and patient group interaction um welcome and um take it away it helps if you do that first before you <laughs> share your screen so i hope phil has not uh got her timer on quite yet here we go so I need to start by saying that I am not an expert in this subject. And so this is really a call to action um, rather than uh, anything um, more uh, sophisticated than that. But I think we all really need to be thinking about health technology assessment from the very start. So health technology assessment is this weighing of the costs to a healthcare system against the benefits to patients and their carers and to society. Um, and what we want to do is to really put, put the weight on the right-hand side there of uh, that seesaw, um, because the people who do the assessment really hate uncertainty. 
And our rare disease uh, trials are full of uncertainty because our numbers are small and we don't always have good comparators. And so we end up in circumstances where we're, we're exactly what they don't like. Um, and so we need to do our very best to make sure that our drugs are not only approved by regulators, but they're actually going to be paid for for patients. So this is just a quick set of ideas about what the various players can be doing to be thinking qualities early and to really put together the best case they can. So if you are a clinical researcher or a clinician and you're involved in trials, start thinking about how to collect that quality of life data on, on the early side. Make sure that the people running the trials are thinking about it um, and that they don't sort of stop at regulatory approval. Don't be afraid to talk about the price and say, hey, you know, this has to be affordable. If you price it like that, we, we aren't going to be able to actually give this to our patients who've just participated in the trial. Help make sure the patients are doing whatever tracking you're asking, because they'll do that if they understand. Um, and make sure that you're collaborating with the, the patient advocacy groups and really helping them get better. Drug companies, um, Meidert Boyson from NICE has said over and over, talk to us early, talk to us early, because things go better if we're, if we're, we're already in touch, even when you're just starting out. Um, work with the patient groups, make sure they know what they're do, but, doing, but also respect that their job is not the same as your job, and they will push back um, if you aren't doing what you need to be doing, and they'll push back on price. Consider this, this sort of brave thing to, if there are other drug companies involved, um, as in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, looking at doing collaborative modeling with, all, with a number of drug companies together. And the patient advocates, they're sort of low hanging fruit and there's harder stuff. So low hanging fruit is understand the process, be ready in advance so that you know what your role is. Look for mentors in, in our patient adv advocacy community. Um, talk to the drug companies before they're starting the trials and remind them that we don't get it unless it's paid for. It isn't just regulation. And make sure that NICE is aware of you. Um, collect your own data. When we um, recently went through uh, the HTA process at NICE, we found that stories were actually quite effective because we were looking at, at a very small number of patients. You don't have to only have quantitative data. You can tip the balance a bit if you have good stories. Um, make sure that the patients and clinicians on the committee are ones who know what they're, what they're doing and they're articulate. Um, and, and be ready to, to put in the time that you need to. Um, and I also want to just uh, propose this idea, um, and, and I'll be curious to see if others would be interested in engaging, but I think there is room for more shared resource um, uh, from, uh, from our stories that patient advocacy groups gather from their experience with HTA. And I just want to um, give a quick shout out to Josie Godfried, who spoke about this, um, the patient advocate role yesterday, and let us know about her new uh, project called Realize Advocacy that is going to have webinars to teach us how to do this and uh, shared materials. Um, I see there in by September, there'll be some modules that are available for free for, for patient groups to get us better at that. And don't be afraid to ask for help. So what about the tougher things? So the tougher things to do are um, considering putting together a patient registry. And we'll hear about that in uh, the next session. That's one of the options. Um, you can go it alone, but you can also work together with the companies who are interested in this data um, and with researchers to really try to, to get that quality of life data from the patient perspective. And think about this project, project Hercules model where you become the sort of catalyst for bringing together drug companies interested in developing a quality of life assessment tool that can be used across multiple um, trials so that they're, you're actually sort of using the same metrics and that can really help strengthen the case for the benefit of the drugs. And also there may be little things that you can do to be, to get your drug to go through the process that is more comfortable with uncertainty, the HST process versus the STA. We don't know what that's going to look like because things are, are changing at NICE um, with their latest methods and process review, but there may still be things that are 
changeable, that are not just, um, just things that are features of your disease that you can't change. So keep an eye on that and think well ahead about whether there's anything you can do. So there are lots of questions here, lots of ands and question marks, and lots of other people will have ideas, um, but I hope people will, will think about this and think about whether there are opportunities to learn from each other. So uh, that's how to contact me if you're interested in thinking together about this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jess. Good job. I think probably about 10, 20 seconds over, depends on what Phil says, so not bad at all. Not bad at all. You're not going to top the leaderboard on that, I'm afraid. But um, actually, a really important topic to raise, and something we're seeing, you know, increasingly the work we do at Find a Cure, the need for patients to think far more about uh, HTA health economics early, but essentially recognizing any data they're collecting and feeding into this process and understanding how. So um, please do reach out to Jess, uh, anyone out there, if you're you're keen to start looking at this together. And um, yeah, thank you for plugging Josie's talk yesterday in one of the pitch and mix sessions that will be available on the platform in a few days time for you all to watch again and I'd, I'd highly recommend doing that. Um, I'm not seeing any questions coming in right now and I'm keen to keep things ticking over so uh, Jess thank you so much I'm going to move on to the next part of the session uh, which isn't in my control I'm going to hand over to the lovely Phil who's going to take you into uh, understanding the student voice prize. Hi there, everyone, and thank you again from, from us at Finding Cure for everyone who's spoken today. Um, I was applauding in my room over here. I thought the talks were such a brilliant mix of different perspectives and really interesting to hear from. So thank you, everyone. I'm here to introduce um, the, the next speaker who is the winner of the Student Voice Prize this year, and that was Katrina Chaplin. And I thought I'd just give you a tiny bit of context into what the Student Voice Prize is. So I manage the Student Voice Prize this year on behalf of Find a Cure. It's a collaborative project that we run in collaboration with the team at Medics for Rare Diseases. This year, well, 2020 was our seventh year of the competition, and we saw our highest number of entries ever, actually, a 69% increase from the year before, which was really great to see. And uh, we kind of drive this engagement with medical students because, as Robert said, if you have a really interested clinician in your, rare, in your rare condition, that can make all the world a difference. And we recognise that there's actually a need to, um, to make rare disease a bit more visible at medical school. And, uh, medical students don't learn a whole lot about rare diseases, and this competition is hoping to get the connections flowing early on between patient groups and between medical students, nurses, biomedical students, and build upon that in the future and really um, get students daring to think rare early on. So with that introduction, um, I'd love to now welcome um, Katrina Chaplin onto the stage to talk about her experience with the 2020 Student Voice Prize. Hello, thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction. Um, my name's Katrina um, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Barts in the London. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you um, today. I'm afraid I don't have any slides, so it's just me. Um, but what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about um, my experiences um, talking to patients um, as part of the Student Voice Prize, um, and then a little bit about um, some of the things I spoke about in my essay, um, and also uh, some kind of take home messages um, for myself, but also for other medical students, which I think are really valuable. Um, so I guess. Um, I wanted to sort of think about why I entered the Student Voice Prize and um, why I think it's a really great thing for medical students to do. Um, so I think often when medical students are in hospital um, learning, it's very focused um, sort of on clinical teaching, obviously, um, taking histories, performing exams, and we don't often get an opportunity to just sit down with patients and simply discuss um, sort of what things are like for them day to day, learn more about what's been going on um, for them sort of over the longer term. So it was really great to have an opportunity to speak to um, multiple patients um, about sort of um, what it really is um, like for them day to day um, and take a more sort of holistic um, approach um, in understanding that. Uh, so I think um, that is a, a really, really good opportunity. Um, and I was lucky enough to be put in touch with um, multiple patients through the UK uh, mastocytosis support group. So um, I have them to thank um, for this um, opportunity as well. So um, I think I want to discuss um, 
some of the things I discussed with these patients. Um, and my essay was very focused on COVID and the impact that um, the pandemic has had um, for these particular patients and um, rare disease patients um, more generally. But I had very long conversations, uh, long conversations that were about much more than the pandemic. And so I wanted to touch on things more generally, because even though my essay was quite focused on um, COVID-19, um, that was actually, you know, only half the conversation. And I learned so much more um, than just about um, the effect of the pandemic on rare diseases. Um, so what did I learn? Um, from the essay. So um, I spoke to three patients um, who, um, or two patients who have mastocytosis um, and the mother of, of a child um, who has mastocytosis. So it was really good to have some different perspectives um, on the condition. Um, and it was really clear that there was massive diversity between um, the patient experiences, um, even um, with the same condition. Um, and in terms of COVID, we discussed a lot of different things. Um, and what I found was interesting was that actually a lot of the problems um, patients um, were having um, or from the ones I spoke to were actually ones that existed before the pandemic and kind of had been exacerbated um, or come into a new, a new light in a way. Um, so one of these things is uncertainty. So um, a lot of rare disease patients um, seem to uh, you know have a lot more uncertainty because there's less research um, or less information readily available and we've all been dealing with increased uncertainty during the pandemic with not knowing when we can do things or make any plans um, but particularly for um, patients I spoke with it was clear that there was a lack of information available about um, their level of risk um, and what to do, should they be shielding, should they not be shielding? And particularly given that um, some patients have um, a more, um, have multiple clinicians looking after their care, um, there's increased chance of there being uh, this confusion um, if there's not a coordinated care between um, these health professionals. Um, so that was something that um, came to light. And then this uh, lack of information particularly focused on shielding. So um, not all patients, um, all the patients I spoke with were shielding during the pandemic. Um, just um, one patient, in fact, um, due to the severity of her condition. Um, and it was really interesting to um, speak to someone who's relatively similar age to myself about shielding, um, because I think um, sometimes in the media it can be portrayed um, as being um, older or um, frailer patients. Um, and I think that it was important to um, sort of see, see that it's actually lots of different people who um, might need to be shielding and see what impact this had. So it was clear that it was having a significant mental health impact um, and something I hadn't really considered before, but actually changing the way someone understands themselves. So um, being suddenly told you're shielding when maybe you hadn't considered yourself as previously vulnerable um, would kind of change um, the way that you looked at your condition. And that was something that I hadn't actually considered before. So it was really interesting to hear from um, that patient. Um, I think another thing we'll also remember from the pandemic at the start of uh, last year in March was uh, the lack of food and loo roll available, um, which, you know, was stressful for everyone. But I think something else um, that came um, out of it for me was um, seeing um, that the patients uh, with mastocytosis who have particular um, needs in terms of food um, and um, particular foods they can eat. Um, meant that that was particularly stressful if they weren't able to access the appropriate and safe foods. Um, and at the same time, also certain medications um, were more difficult um, to access. However, this is kind of an example of something which um, the pandemic is perhaps um, exacerbated or um, um, changed, but actually limitations to um, medications is quite a problem for many um, patients with mastocytosis um, and other um, rare disease patients. And so whilst this is something that's 
perhaps been exacerbated during COVID-19, this isn't something new and is a problem which needs addressing. Um, another final thing that um, I sort of reflected on um, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 was the challenges of adapting to the new environment as we emerge from the pandemic. So it's not just about um, sort of shielding and lockdown, but actually as the environment has changed um, and the health service provisions have changed um, for patients. Um, so um, they must adjust to this new environment and that actually has um, a lot of impact as well. So um, particularly for mastocytosis patients, um, because um, they can have their symptoms triggered, um, which includes anaphylaxis by certain um, chemicals, um, air fresheners, cleaning products. Obviously, in this new um, hyper sterile environment we now um, all live in, this is particularly difficult. So I've discussed a few different things there uh, regarding um, some points I made in my essay um, about the impact um, that I've uh, was um, the impact of COVID-19 on the patients I spoke to, um, which can't speak to all rare disease patients, but um, I'm sure there are some um, similarities um, with some of the things I've said amongst the rare disease community. Um, however, I also felt there were a lot of um, things I learned that weren't uh, sort of COVID specific, um, but seemed to really affect these patients. So. Um, the lack of awareness um, from both public and health professionals regarding their disease had a significant impact um, on um, their experience of their disease and also um, their health um, care treatment. So, um, for example, having to explain to um, medical professionals in A&E why a specific um, test was needed um, or having to explain to your colleagues um, why you're having to shield because um, you don't uh, you know, look unwell, so to say. And um, this, you know, it was clear from speaking to these patients that it was uh, very burdensome and very um, difficult to have to constantly um, justify um, their sort of special requirements or needs based on um, their health. So in summary, my sort of learning points um, for myself and for other medical students is that it's really important to listen to patients um, because you're not always the expert, um, very much so um, when it comes to rare disease. And I think it's really important for um, medical students to be happy um, to accept that and also other clinicians um, that um, they can learn just as much from the patient and that they need to work with them um, and in a partnership to ensure that they um, are giving the patient the, the care that they need. Um, and I think quite often in medical school teaching with rare, in rare disease is very much focused on um, the sort of um, physiological aspects of the disease. And, in, and we're not necessarily taught uh, how to approach or manage a patient with a rare, rare disease in a more holistic manner and how you're actually going to um, manage it in practice, um, not just thinking about the sort of mechanisms um, behind the disease. Um, so thank you so much for having me today um, and um, for inviting me to speak and I'll, I'll take any questions if there are any. Trina, thank you so much uh, for sharing those learnings with us and I'm so glad that you were able to see so much of the lived experience of what it was like to actually live with mastocytosis, especially during the pandemic where things were so different to normal. Yeah. And I really enjoyed reading your essay. You can read um, Katrina's essay over in the exhibitor space for the Student Voice Prize. You can also read the other uh, brilliant runners up essays. Katrina's is on the Orphanet Journal of Rare Diseases, which is very exciting. And hopefully we'll um, be going into the future having even more high quality essays coming at us that we can really dive into. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the sponsors of the Student Voice Prize this year. So we've got Caselli Medical, Transcript, Lingomatics and Dolon. We wouldn't be able to do it without them and we wouldn't be able to keep growing it um, without, without their continued support. Um, so yeah, be sure to check out those essays and coming up in autumn 2021 will be uh, the Student Voice Prize 2021 and we'd love to see even more patient groups getting involved with the patient pairing process so that you can share your experience with medical students and maybe even be part of a winning essay so you never know but yeah thank you everyone for your continued support your entries and the time that you give to this competition.
Awesome stuff. Thank you so much again, Katrina. Um, just a, a quick note. I, I always think it's great to hear and, and see the medical students themselves take the stage and speak at these kind of events. I'm sure it's a daunting thing to do. And this, I, I don't know which is worse, seeing a crowd of faces in front of you or talking to yourself, um, which is what we feel like we're doing right now. But you, you managed it brilliantly. And it, it matters to the patient groups, particularly to, to hear young doctors um, thinking about uh, how to actually deal with a case of a rare disease that comes in front of them. And, and I think it's really encouraging to see that. So thank you so much for answering. And, and hopefully you'll stay super active with, with medics for rare diseases. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll hope to see much more of you in the future. So thank you so much for that, Katrina. Um, we, we're coming towards the close of our session now. But we've got a little tiny bit of time and uh, a really nice question just popped in uh, from Phil herself, actually. So I was wondering um, if uh, all of our speakers might want to turn their, their cameras on briefly. And Phil, if you just want to pose this general question and uh, if, if no one instantly volunteers uh, an answer, I will pick on some people just to see if we have any more thoughts on, on this point. So Phil, please take it away. Yeah, so actually this was kind of um, prompted by something that Robert said about um, finding a few clinicians who really are interested in your recognition can have a huge impact. Um, and we talked a lot over the next few days about collaboration and how it takes lots of different people to make a drug repurposing project come to life. How can we actually um, kind of build sustainable infrastructure or find clinicians that want to get involved with our red conditions, especially when they're ultra rare or maybe there's a small patient group how can we sustain that connection and get that connection going um, so that we can actually make the most of these opportunities? Don't know who's best place. I'm always happy yes. to chat. Yes, I knew you'd come in. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I've been a, a known I was a patient for more than 30 years. And I think, you know, part of what has helped me to develop relationships with clinicians and help them, I hope, move forward and, and stay interested is by connecting them to patients and making it easier for them to do their jobs, um, thinking about what their incentives are, um, you know, that they need to, for example, if, if they're interested in academic work, that they need to be able to publish. And so what can we do to make that possible. Um, and I think, you know, that's a key relationship. Finding finding younger ones is great before they've settled. Um, you know, if you if there's, you know, a fellow who's beginning to work in your area, seeing if you can sort of encourage the enthusiasm, I would say those are those are strategies that that I think um, that I've tried anyway. Thank you, Jess. Rob, any kind of brief comments to add there? I've probably got long rambling comments. Um, not, not really, no, I thought about breaking down barriers. I think there's a lot of great initiatives, um, but but they're not always very well signposted in, in one place. Um, I, I think um, understanding incentives and barriers for each group of people involved in the process is, is crucial. Um, and I, I very strongly agree that um, if, if you can get the interest of a fellow, you know, a, a thrusting younger doctor who's making their way in the world, that's that's a, a brilliant thing to capitalize on. Um, and I think a, I think a strong patient group to work with is a great asset in both making the the uh, engaged researchers job easier and also um, in helping bring them to to other opportunities and, and other authorities. So. Uh, yeah, so, so I think the, the more one-stop portals we have and toolkits we have to explain the landscape to people and point them to all the great resource, the, the better. So. Thank you so much. Okay, and with that, I'm going to wrap the session and, and thank, firstly, all of you guys for, for speaking. It's been a really enjoyable session. I think we've learned a huge amount and covered a huge amount of ground, so thank you for that. Um, I've got a lot of plugs to do. Um, firstly, um, please do go and have a look at our exhibition spaces. We've got exhibits from Medics for Rare Diseases who are tackling this very question. We've got exhibits from Purposeful, our first speaker. We've got exhibitions from the Student Voice Prize where you can go look at and read the essays of our students themselves. So please check those things out. Uh, it, it really is very important. We've also got our discussion boards where we're trying to get a bit of interaction and discussion around some of the pertinent topics in, in repurposing today. I personally would love to hear your answers to all the questions I came up with. So, so please do let me know about that. Uh, coming up next, uh, we're diving into some, some breakout rooms and sessions for you to get a chance to discuss some very different areas. Uh, really want to 
you know, drive forward, come, come in, talk to us, uh, let's engage on these topics. Uh, one coming up looking at repurposing in the EU, you know, what can we tap into at the European level to really help drive forward this, this key message of collaboration, which I think we've all agreed in this session is central to making repurposing work. So do check that out. We're also talking about registries and data, um, what quality data can bring to help, uh, to, to help you deliver your repurposing programme effectively. So maybe for those of you in patient group world, you might want to top into to that session. And finally, you know, IP front and centre of all of these issues. We'd love to hear your thoughts on intellectual property and how we can capitalise on those strategies to make the most of repurposing opportunities. So please check out those sessions. They start in 15 minutes time. Uh, and then later on this afternoon, we'll be diving into the AKU story, uh, a great story to, to see really uh, something going from right from inception through to the delivery to patients and, and talking to all the different players in the AK Society did that. So please check that out. Um, finally, it is incumbent upon me to uh, try and share a slide while stumbling across my conversation and uh, thank uh, all of our sponsors uh, at the conference today who've uh, kept it going and uh, really made a huge difference to the event. So you can see those slides here. Thank you, the audience, for engaging. Uh, thank you to all my speakers for taking part. And we look forward uh, to engaging with you more and seeing you in the next session. Thank you so much.